Latunda Easton here, Church School Superintendent with St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church here in Sacramento, California, where the Reverend Philip R. Cousin Jr. is our pastor. Welcome back to our um, St. Andrew's AME Church School Bible lesson for today, March 20th, 2022. We're continuing our quarter on God frees and redeems. And we are in unit one of that quarter, Liberating Passover. We use the Precepts for Living study guide here at St. Andrews for our curriculum. If you have your study guide, grab it and turn to the lesson for March the 20th. Our lesson today is Celebrate Passover Liberation. And we're going to be looking at Ezra chapter 6, verses 13 through 22, which continues from our last two weeks in Ezra. Our lesson aim, as stated here in our study guide, is to explore the celebration prompted by the completion of the new temple. Identify reasons to celebrate God's goodness and join together as believers in celebrating and sharing the good news of God's love. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you for your word. We praise you and we thank you for what you have for us this morning. Lord God, we want to hear from you this morning. Lord God, open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to everything that you have for each of us individually through this um, Bible lesson and this passage that we are going to dig into this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so today, technically today, I think today, tomorrow, is the first day of spring. And you know, sometimes we find ourselves looking for reasons to celebrate. And sometimes there's something that really deserves celebration, and sometimes celebration provides an opportunity for those of us to rejoice and to celebrate after a difficult task or after we get through something. Well, today we're going to look at some reasons that the Israelites found to celebrate. Now, we've been in the book of Ezra for the last two weeks, and after the temple was completed, the Israelites celebrated God by sharing the Passover together. Now, look how far the Israelites have come in the 20 plus years. I mean, they started the book of Ezra as a broken, incarcerated people far from home. And their temple system, on which the law of Moses depended, looked dead and it looked buried. And yet, here a few years later, they are celebrating the Passover after dedicating the new temple. I mean, how did all this happen? What's behind it all? Well, just a reminder um, from last week that the book of Ezra is a story of God's redeeming work, bringing his people out of exile and back to the promised land. Ezra is a story of God calling a people back into relationship with him, and it concludes by anticipating an even greater redemption that is yet to come, Jesus Christ. Now, the book of Ezra teaches us that God keeps his promises from generation to generation by redeeming his people so that they might enjoy a relationship with him. God has promised to redeem, and God keeps his promises. Okay, so um, look with me in your study guide if you have it. Um, our study guide provides a nice little recap. So first, we're going to recap the last couple of weeks. Now, the decree had gone forth from King Cyrus for the children of Israel to rebuild the temple after their captivity in Babylon, so after their exile and their captivity in Babylon. Now, unfortunately, this job was not completed under Cyrus's reign, and because of this, when the Jews were trying to complete the temple later, local leaders raised concerns about who told them to rebuild the temple. We looked at this last week. Now, Darius was king at the time, and he issued an order that the archives be searched for the decree made by King Cyrus. Now, that decree was discovered, it was found, and King Darius, in turn, issued his own decree to finish the work. Now, the expenses of this project were to be fully paid out of the royal treasury so that the work would not stop. Now, whatever was needed, the bulls, the rams, all of the animals, the offerings, the wheat, the salt, the wine, as requested by the priests in Jerusalem, must be given to them daily without fail so that they could offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. Now, this is where our lesson begins today. So basically, our lesson today picks up exactly where we left off in chapter 6 last week. So first, we're going to dig into the passage. We're just going to look at the passage. 
We're going to see what it says, and then we're going to talk about the meaning of the passage. So grab your study guide or your Bibles, and we will start with verses 13 through 18. So Tatanai, governor of the province west of the Euphrates River, and Shathar Bosnai and their co colleagues complied at once with the command of King Darius. So the Jewish elders continued their work, and they were greatly encouraged by the preaching of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Ido. The temple was fully finished, as had been commanded by the God of Israel and decreed by Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, the kings of Persia. The temple was completed on March 12th during the sixth year of King Darius's reign. The temple of God was then dedicated with great joy by the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the people who had returned from exile. During the dedication ceremony for the temple of God, 100 young bulls, 200 rams, and 400 male lambs were sacrificed, and 12 male goats were presented as a sin offering for the 12 tribes of Israel. Then the priests and Levites were divided into their various divisions to serve at the temple of God in Jerusalem as prescribed in the book of Moses. So here the Israelites, they had a new reason to celebrate. The temple was finally completed. God's people had been through so much. I mean, they had endured all kinds of obstacles, but the finished product was now visible and they were rejoicing. They were celebrating. The Israelites, I mean, they had a time and a half trying to build the temple. I mean, the Persian King Cyrus, he had already given them permission. He gave them materials to build it, but then the Israelites got them in trouble and they stopped. And then after the prophets Haggai and Zechariah roused the people with God's words of encouragement, they began work on the temple again. And again, they were stopped by the political enemies. And this time, when they petitioned the new King Darius, he sent orders not only for the temple to be built and materials provided, but also that those political enemies would help the Israelites from then on, or at least leave them alone to do the work. Now, this major building project is completed. The Israelites dedicate the temple of God with great joy in verse 16. So they gather together for this huge feast, partaking of their portion of the hundreds of animals that they sacrificed. And they were rejoicing. They were celebrating. They were worshiping. They were praising because the favor of the Lord had been upon them. And they sought to honor God by reinstituting worship at the temple. And to start work and to see it to completion, that's a sign of God's grace. And you know what? Israel knew this. It was all God. They knew it was all God. It was God who initiated this project by his spirit, by the Holy Spirit. It was God who guided their hands to its completion. Their new temple is definitely a reason to celebrate. This is definitely a reason for them to celebrate. You know, all of our victories and all of our accomplishments are because of God and because of God's favor on us. So how many times... Um, do we complete a task or we get through something after many struggles and then somehow get it in our hearts that it was our doing or by our own strength? Okay, let's look at verses 19 through 21. I forgot to mention our study guide has both the King James Version and New Living Translation parallel, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Okay, 19 through 21. On April 21st, the returned exiles celebrated Passover. The priests and Levites had purified themselves and were ceremonially clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests, and for themselves. The Passover meal was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile and by the others in the land who had turned from their corrupt practices to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay, so now they have kind of this former reason to celebrate. So just one month after they finished the temple building, they have another reason to celebrate, the Passover. Now, this celebration is a former one that had dated back nearly a thousand years. And the Passover reminds the Israelite people of the event that had made them into a people, that had made them into a nation. Now, the Exodus and all the events surrounding it Passover, this Passover celebration, is when they remember how God, with his vast, his powerful hand, his outstretched arm, um, put these ten plagues on Egypt, 
brought the Israelites out of bondage, led them through the Red Sea to dry land, guided them through the wilderness day and night, and spoke to them from the holy mountain of Sinai. They bring their sacrifices to this new temple. And these sacrifices are not so much a feast as they are to purify the nation. And as Ezra and the other returnees observe the Passover, they are separating themselves from the surrounding nation, just as God separated them as a people long ago from Egypt. Now this Passover celebration as celebrated by the Hebrew people is a reflection. It is an evidence of God's divine intervention in the life of his people, in the life of God's people. And they observe this reason to celebrate, another reason for them to celebrate. You know, when God blesses us to complete a task or he just blesses us in general, he blesses us every day. You know what? Let's rejoice. Let's celebrate in hope. Let's worship. Let's rededicate and recommit ourselves to God. Okay, let's look at verse 22. Then they celebrated the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. There was great joy throughout the land because the Lord had caused the king of Assyria to be favorable to them so that he helped them to rebuild the temple of God, the God of Israel. Okay, so now they have this ongoing constant reason to celebrate. After observing the Passover, it says here, then the Israelites go on celebrating with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I mean, the Israelites, they continue to find reasons to celebrate because it says right here, there was great joy throughout the land. These returned exiles know that despite their trials, despite their struggles, they always have a reason to celebrate, and that's because God was and is always with them. In both the old Passover celebration and this new temple celebration, the common thread here is and was God's abundant grace, God's abundant presence, God's abundant provision, and God's abundant protection. And Ezra acknowledges that God was the one who caused the king of Assyria to be favorable to them. God was the one to protect them from Tatanai and Shathar Bosnai and their companions. God had given them the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah. God owns the cattle, these hundred bulls, 200 rams, the 400 lambs, and on and on that went into the temple dedication. God provided the priests and Levites to perform their service in the temple, and God provided the law that told them what to do. And finally, God even empowered the Israelites to rebuild the temple. And in and through all of that, even through those years of exile, God is there and God was there providing and protecting them and covering them with his grace. Now, what better reason to celebrate and to worship and to praise is there. So what do we learn? What are some key points or some key takeaways? What do we learn about God here? You know, God's purpose is to make it possible for his people to worship him and to fill them with joy in that worship. And we should worship God every day. You know, we see here that God's rule, sovereign rule is not aimless. Because it wasn't aimless in this whole situation here with the Israelites. God works in the world to bring about his purposes, which are always for our good. And you know what? More exactly, God enables his people to come to him directly in worship. Because in the Old Testament times, this was impossible without the temple in place so that the sacrifices could be made. Now, the focus on this temple rebuilding turns out to be kind of a step on the way to the goal of acceptable worship being offered to God in accordance with the law of Moses. This was and is God's doing, and he brought and he brings joy to his people by making it happen. Now, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God enables us to come to him directly. God ordered even the crucifixion of his own son, and he continues to order events today to this end. Our salvation is completely dependent upon God's providential hand, both in the events of Calvary and also in the circumstances of our own lives. And such a providential working should fill us with joy. God's working, our salvation is a reason to celebrate every day. God's presence, God's grace, God's gift of salvation is a reason to celebrate and worship God every day. So what does this mean for us? 
Well, we are in the midst of Lent, and that's a 40-day practice observed between Ash Wednesday and Easter. But you know what? It's a time for sober reflection and fasting. And as believers, we are encouraged to take time to celebrate. You know what? Every morning when we get up, as we rise with a new day full of God's new mercies, full of God's grace, full of God's presence, full of his protection, his gift of salvation, we have, that's a time to celebrate. You know, and when we remember that reason to celebrate, we will discover that there are more and more reasons to celebrate all around us. You know, throughout the year, we take the time, we celebrate people's birthdays, we celebrate federal holidays, we celebrate, you know, after a, a tough time, we tend to kick back for some R&R, &R, we celebrate. And even in the midst of these hard times, it's good to relax and celebrate what God is doing. And we should celebrate God through the hard times. You know, really, any time is a good time to celebrate. Because, simply because we know Jesus, simply because we have his gift of salvation, simply because we have his grace, his presence, his protection, what other reason do we need? You know, when we understand what God is doing in the world and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ, our hearts should be filled with joy. And God should look, that, that God should even look upon us so favorably, that God should even love us so much. And, you know, the celebration of the Passover shows, again, how God's rescue of his people then anticipated a greater rescue in Jesus Christ. So our response to God, to our salvation, should be an overflowing joy of rescue in Jesus Christ. What is your response to God's grace? What is your response to God's gift of salvation? Knowing that God has enabled us to come to him directly, our response should be to celebrate with joy every day. And with godly hindsight, we can see how God does indeed work all things for our good. And he fills us with joy as we grasp all these truths about him. Let's pray. Lord God, you are our Redeemer. You are our Deliverer. We just thank you for your gift of salvation. We thank you for rescuing us through Jesus. We thank you for loving us. Lord God, help us to celebrate you every day. Help us to share the good news of your love with someone every day. Amen. Okay, I will see you back here at 9 a.m. We are going to we are going to celebrate through song and praise with our Victory Praise Team. And then I will see you at 1030 for either in-person worship at 2131 8th Street here in Sacramento or on Facebook Live. And next week, our lesson title is Lest We Forget. And we are going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 8. So your background reading for next week is Deuteronomy chapter 8. You guys be blessed and I will see you for next week's Bible lesson. Have a great week.